Traditionally, athlete strength is measured by one repetition maximum test, but these can be time consuming and they can also be really fatiguing for the athlete. So in recent times, isometric testing has become an often preferred option. An isometric test such as the isometric mid-thigh pull still correlates very well with a one repetition max. They enable strength testing in a much more time efficient manner, as well as less fatiguing for the athlete. There are a number of different options available and actually the isometric belt squat has been gathering a bit more attention and interest because it removes the potential limiting factor of grip strength or upper body strength. But most commonly, the isometric mid-side pull has been used both in research and applied practice. And in this video, we're going to tell you everything you need to know about isometric mid-side pull strength testing. So with an isometric mid-side pull, you play force plates underneath the athlete's feet to capture the force measures during the test. Then we want to have an immovable barbell. So either fixed into a rack or heavily weighted so they cannot move regardless of the force that the athlete places through it. The athlete's position is comparable to the second pull of a clean. So an upright chest with arms straight and the bar somewhere in the mid thigh. Research by Tom DeSantos has shown that a hip angle of around 145 degrees is best for this test. Generally then that puts the knee angle somewhere between 125 and 145 degrees. Now, when you're doing this with an athlete for the first time, you want to use a goniometer so that you can set up these joint angle and have the athlete in the best position. But ideally you have a system set up so that you can keep a track of the bar position for each athlete so that you don't need to then measure these joint angles every single time. So that might be doing it, for instance, with a, a custom built rack that allows you to place the bar at fixed points. Some really important points for the protocol for the isometric mid-side pull. You need to be consistent when it comes to straps or the use of chalk. Both of these generally help to increase the amount of force the athlete can put out in an isometric mid thigh pull because it removes the limiting factor of grip strength. So it's really important that you're consistent, whether that is always doing it with or always doing it without. When you're chopping and changing between them, we can't then know if a difference or a change is meaningful based on the athlete's physical capacities or whether it's due to a change in equipment. Similarly, the cueing on this test is critical. Do you want to cue the athlete to push hold into the ground, to pull up on the bar? Be consistent. Remember, this is an isometric test. We do not want any movement, any counter movement or actual movement of the bar itself. Now, a decision for the practitioner to make is whether to cue hard and fast or with a gradual buildup. If you cue your athlete to pull hard and as fast as possible, this then enables the measurement an assessment of rate of force development in the test. How quickly can they produce force? That does then make the exercise or the test a bit more intense because they're going from a, a ready primed position into this maximal piece as fast as possible. The approach I've often taken is actually to not worry about RFD and to focus on building the force gradually to a peak. I do value RFD as a capacity and as a measure, but we consistently see it is less reliable than some of our other measures. And when athletes are less familiar with this test, they can be perhaps a jarring if they try and do it suddenly, if they're not used to it. And so my preference is just to take out that risk altogether and cue them to build up gradually to the point rather than cueing fast. But if you're working with athletes, who are very competent at lifters who are used to doing the isometric mid side pull, then by all means, queuing hard and fast and utilizing the RFD data may be very valuable in your setting. Generally, the pull lasts about three to five seconds. So make sure you're giving your athletes enough time for them to reach that peak. And research does recommend a rest time of generally three to five minutes in between reps, but the reality of the applied testing means that's not always possible. And probably a one to two minute rest between trials is more common. Generally, I like to do a 50% rep for a warm up, then a 75% rep, followed by two, perhaps three trials at maximum if they're showing improvements across the trials. 
So now you've collected data from your isometric mid-side pool in a valid and reliable manner using a very consistent protocol as we just described. What now with the analysis? Well, the first thing to do is to check the trace, the raw course time curve. We want to look for errors in the data. And two key things to look out for this test. Firstly, check for a counter movement, so a dip in the force trace at the start of the test. That will show, and you may even be able to see it with your eye whilst you're doing the test and remove the trial, or check it in the data. If the athlete has a tiny dip, a tiny counter movement, then it's not become an isometric test. So look for that at the start of the movement. And then we often see a spike towards the end when the athlete relaxes or then releases the tension, sometimes they shift their weight and they move slightly and that causes a bit of a bump on the trace where they've lifted the bar. So again, in that case, the peak force would not be a valid measure of the actual peak force they were putting out during the isometric inside pull. Thank you to Vault Performance for sponsoring this video. Vault Performance's four Dex plates automatically detect and analyze more than 15 common force plate tests. Measure, train, and monitor strength with Forstex, the world's fastest, easiest, and most powerful dual force plate system for analyzing neuromuscular strength and imbalance. To learn more or to book a demo, check out Valve Performance website at valveperformance.com. Now, if you've double-checked the validity of your data by using the raw force time curve, you can have a look at the peak force output. And of course, then you can use this number to compare an athlete over time. How are their maximum isometric force capacities changing through the course of a year or with a training program? If you're comparing across athletes, you can obviously do so with the peak force. Much like I talked about in the hamstring strength testing episode, body weight has a big impact on the test. So there's a couple of different ways that we can take this into account. As usual, we could just divide the force by the athlete's body weight to get a relative force output. One thing I like to do with this test from a communication perspective is to convert the body mass into newtons, whether it's kilos or pounds, we can convert their body mass into newtons and then divide the force output in newtons by their body weight in newtons. And then this just gives us a figure that's sort of two, three, four, maybe. And then this is a really nice way to communicate to the athlete that they pulled twice their body weight on the bar or three times their body weight. Just by normalizing it all to newtons, it gives us a nice, easy way to describe it and feed it back to the athlete and as well as our staff members. When we're dealing with a group of athletes with very variable body mass, however, we might want to actually use allometric scaling. And this calculation scales the body mass to an exponent. That exponent may be calculated from your own data set, or it might, you might use a value shown in the literature. For instance, one study by Kruta and colleagues suggested an uh, exponent of 0.67, and that should then allow you to compare all your athletes consistently across the different body mass. As I mentioned earlier, if you have cued the athlete to pull hard and fast, then you will want to look at the rate of force development metrics. Generally, a time threshold is used here to see what the peak rate of force development is over, say, the first 50 milliseconds or perhaps the first 200 milliseconds. And again, whichever you choose there, it's important to be consistent with the metric and the time frame that you're looking at. If you're using dual force platforms like Forstex from Valve Performance, then you'll be able to look at the force through the left and the right side. And we can see some interesting asymmetries here in our athletes in terms of the amount of force they're putting through the unilateral sides, even though it is a bilateral demand. So those loading results can be interesting, particularly in rehab. And we want to look at the, the loading between left and right sides in our isometric tasks here compared to our dynamic tasks, such as the counter movement job. The final type of analysis that we might want to do is the dynamic strength index. This is the ratio of force that an athlete can produce during the dynamic movement of a counter movement jump compared to the force that they produce during this isometric stationary movement with the mid-side pull. Now, ratios do have their limitations, but I do like this as a broad index to help guide our programming. So the DSI can guide you whether the athlete needs more ballistic training. Perhaps they have a high 
forced development capacities through the isometric tests, but we're not seeing a much greater output when they're then able to move dynamically. So we want to work down the ballistic end of the spectrum to try and train them in those properties. Or alternatively, perhaps that they are very dynamic through the counter movement jump. We're seeing that they are explosive, that they're using their force capacity. So actually what we want to do is build that maximum strength engine more to then produce more power. Or perhaps they sit in between the two and therefore concurrent training is the best way to program for them going forward. So for more information resources on the dynamic strength index, I'll pop some links below in the description. So of course, this test is focusing on the isometric strength capacities. As we know, there are many other capacities involved in physical development. And although there are very good correlations between 1RM and isometric testing, of course, it is still somewhat of a proxy. As I've mentioned, grip strength can be a limiting factor for athletes' performance in this test. So you can try and eliminate that with straps or chalk, as I mentioned before, but make sure you always do that. And as I said, the isometric belt squat is gathering more interest and pace, but we still have to understand a little bit more through research about this test. It can be an unfamiliar task in certain sports if athletes are either not familiar with Olympic lifting or this test type. So then the testing protocol and the queuing that you use through this test is even more important. Overall though, the isometric mid thigh pull is a simple and safe test that enables a global strength measure on our athletes in a very time efficient and most importantly, a non-fatiguing manner. What's more, it can help guide us in our programming and our bucketing or our mailboxing of athletes when we combine it with other testing data, such as counter movement jump data. Hope you enjoyed this video and keep a lookout for a next video in our strength testing series sponsored by Val Performance coming very soon.